Hey everyone, this is Louis7, and today I am interviewing the producer for the Lord of the Rings Online, Reninia. And I do want to point out this is my first interview ever, so let me know how it goes. And hello, Reninia. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, so I thought to start off, could you introduce yourself and maybe share a little bit on how you got started working with Lotro? Sure, yeah. So uh, I'm Reninia, uh, as, uh, as you said, producer for, for Lotro. I started uh, almost three months ago now. Um, I've been in games for oh Lord uh, nine years almost uh, around that around that amount of time now. Um, I started in QA, uh, shifted over to production uh, several years back. Um, Lotro was a game that I had the the benefit of playing actually shortly when it went uh, free to play around that time around 2011. Um, and it was uh, it was a game that I was super familiar with. Um, I also played DDO. Um, I should say super familiar with. I was reasonably familiar with that at the time that I played it. Um, but uh, uh, I was looking for my next opportunity uh, a little while back, and Standing Stone had an opening. I talked to some folks, uh, and they were they were interested. So so here I am, and I'm uh, excited to see you know what we can do with Lotro. I know it's. Uh, it's a game that's been around for a long time, but I, yeah. I really do feel like there's a lot of really awesome opportunities still cool. to come. That is exciting to hear. And uh, one thing I am wondering is what do you actually do as a producer for the game? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so so I think there's mainly like three things that I would say that I do. So, so the three big things that I focus on are uh, communication, organization, and planning. So communication primarily I'm talking about within the studio, uh, within the team uh, mostly, but obviously sometimes between our team and other teams at the studio or our team and uh, other parts of Daybreak or EG7. Um, but primarily focused on communication within the team. And the goal there is to make sure that, you know, people throughout the team have a good understanding of what's going on, what we're trying to accomplish, why we're trying to accomplish it, so that as they're working on their stuff, they can make sure that they're uh, aligned with what everyone else is doing. We're trying to break down silos, prevent people from sort of going off into the woods somewhere and, and coming back with something uh, that's that can really surprise us. Obviously, sometimes that's really cool, but sometimes that can be detrimental for the, for the broader game. Okay. Um, with, with organization, it's similar to that, but thinking in terms of like, how do we, uh, how do we not, not only just communicate these ideas, but how do we get our work done, right? Um, how do we make sure that the things that we start uh, end up getting into the game and getting into the game the best condition possible? Um, and then with planning, it's it's thinking ahead, right? Um, what are the things that we want to do in the future? What are the, the goals that we want to accomplish and how can we get there? Um, so those are broadly the, the three things that I'm tasked with to, to work on. All right. Um, and I think you shared on the forums that you have started playing the game again. Uh, one thing I'm curious is just a little bit your experience playing it, something maybe you really have liked about the game, your favorite part so far? <sighs> That's a good question. Yeah, so I've been playing, I have a hunter and a captain right now. Um, I've mostly been playing my captain recently. Um, I think that the part that's been really interesting for me is I've, I've also been reading the books. Uh, I, try, I read the books a little bit as a kid ages ago, uh, so I've been trying to, to read and, and really understand them at this point. Uh, and it's been it, one of the things that caught me is that um, I completely forgot about Tom Bombadil uh, in the books, and I got to that part, and then a, a little bit after that, uh, after reading it, I, I got to that part of the game as well, and it was uh, impressive to me how this part, which, you know, wasn't in the movies at all, obviously, like how accurate it felt to the books, how much it felt like I was in that space. And up until that point, I didn't feel like the journey that I was going on was really aligned. I, I was playing a, 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 a human captain, so I wasn't, you know, following Frodo's journey. Uh, but this is the first part where it really intersected and it felt really impressive to me uh, as someone who was, who was going through that story right at the same time that I was experiencing it. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting to hear because I personally have never actually read the books. Most of my Lord of the Rings story is from the game, which I like that experience, but... I hear that we're very, very authentic, but I'm still working my way through it, so I can't I can't okay. say for sure. <laughs> All right. Um, is there a part contrasting that that you maybe have thought could be improved within the game oh from your experience? Yes, that's the short okay. version. Yes, there's. I think there's a lot of things that we can improve. Um, 
off the top of my head, um, I think uh, I, talk, I think I've talked about this before, but I think our new player experience um, is pretty out of date at this point. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, like just just for for starters, like we we rely a lot on tooltip pop-ups to say, hey, here's this new thing that we just opened up for you, introduced to you, um, and that's. Uh, you know, you play games these days, that's not the tutorial standard anymore, right? There's a lot more uh, teaching players as opposed to telling players these days. Um, but I think that there's there's opportunities with the way that we uh, do our monetization, even at low levels. Um, one thing I've talked about before is like the wallet upgrade. Um, it's, I, I don't think that that is a particularly helpful aspect of the game um but it extends to other pieces as well you know i ran into uh some some wildwood content uh that was unavailable to me because i was playing as a free player uh, and it was like okay this is what it, this is what the presentation looks like i feel like there's opportunities there for us to to integrate that kind of stuff more effectively or even just rethink our, some of our content strategies in general i don't think that means that wildwood type stuff should go away i think that we need to do a better job of making it fit um, and think about how that fits both with the way that we release the content, but also the way that the players experience the content. Um, I've got a lot of buttons. Uh, I've got a lot of situational buttons, and you know I feel like I've got a decent handle on my rotations thus far. Um, but it's those things like oh, you know, removing corruptions, removing diseases, and uh, it, it's it's a, lo a lot of other MMOs have sort of simplified some of those crufts, um, and I think we still have a lot of ours. And I don't know that there's necessarily a good or correct answer to how to deal with that, um, but it's something that I think that we should definitely think about. Um, so yeah, so a lot of a lot of the thoughts that I've had about the the game thus far have been focused on my experience as a new player, um, and I totally understand that there's a there's a whole other world uh, as I progress through the game, especially getting to end game. Um, but looking from my perspective as a new player. I think that there are definitely lots of really good areas for improvement, and some of those will uh, really benefit brand new people coming into the game. But I think a lot of them will also benefit folks who you know, have alts or don't have VIP every month, uh, that kind of stuff as well. So I think that, that there's, there's broader opportunities there as well. OK. Do you think there would be, I guess, the potential to actually see some of these changes in the future? Yes. OK. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a timeline for that yet. Okay. Um, but that goes back to my conversation around, around planning, right? Um, so I can tell you right now, um, I've had conversations already around uh, updating our monetization. Um, those conversations are still fairly early. Like we've identified some good areas and we're starting to talk about, okay, how how fundamentally do we want to shift things? And if we want to shift things fairly fundamentally, where do we move those things to? Um, we have, we're at the point where we're mostly ideating, but we're starting to nail some stuff down some of these changes are a little bit easier to make than others right like like the fact that i don't like the wallet upgrade it's it's relatively easy for us to basically grant that to every player and then remove it from the store um that doesn't mean that it's a simple change it just means that compared to i don't know uh you know changing fundamentally the way that legendary points are earned uh it's a lot simpler to make one little change than it is to make uh, a much bigger holistic thing um so that's the kind of stuff that we're thinking about and we're talking about internally, and those are conversations that I'm pushing on. Um, and the team is really excited to have a lot of these conversations, which has been great for me personally. Uh, you know, you're always worried as a new person coming in uh, whether or not they're, they're going to like some of the ideas and questions that you have for them, but they've been super responsive, and, uh, and I've been really enjoying that. Um, my hope is that uh, most of these things will come, or I didn't say most of these things, but some of these things I think I would like to see shortly after Gundabad releases. Okay. Um, maybe the end of the maybe the end of the year, but probably mo some of the bigger ones, especially, will will take longer. All right. I don't know if you have any specifics yet, though. But have you considered maybe approach that other MMOs are using with old expansions being included in something like a subscription? Yeah, that's something that we talked about. Um, I think that I don't like the way that we handle that right now. Um, I can say that personally. Um, I don't think, it, generally speaking, at the studio, anyone's particularly a huge fan of it. Um, I think it's sort of one of those things that a decision was made at some point, and the inertia of that decision has carried forward. Um, 
So that's one of those things that we are talking about and going, is this the way that we should be doing, you know, in 2021 and 2022? Um, that's one where, again, I don't know if that will affect, if that will come into, pl whatever decision we make there will come into place before Gundabad. I'm hopeful that it will be shortly thereafter, though. Okay. Um, because I don't think that it is, frankly, if I'm a new player, right, and I'm coming in today, uh, or you're trying to you're not you're trying to convince a friend of yours to play for the first time. It's going to be really tough to convince them that you know once they hit fifty that they have to buy Moria, and then once they hit sixty they have to buy. I think is it is it Mirkwood or Isengard? I can never remember the order there. It's Mirkwood at that point. Mirkwood, yeah. thank you. Uh, and then five five levels later is Isengard, right? And so yeah. on and so forth, right? Like there's there's just you're constantly getting getting hit with these uh, reasonably expensive uh, transactions that you need to progress the game. And the Trove helps with that to an extent. It, it makes that a lot less painful than it used to be. Um, but I believe the Trove just only takes you as far as Minas Morgul before you have to start purchasing again. Um, and I don't think that that is necessarily benefiting us in the way that most of our players are playing. Um, I think that is actually, you know, that we, we're making some money off of that, obviously, but I think that we're losing more potential, frankly, money long term because those players aren't sticking around to experience things. They're they're leaving uh, because they're they're seeing, you know, this pretty hard wall of I have to buy this old expansion. Um, and I think that we would rather monetize around exciting players uh than forcing players to, to to do something and then them later feeling relieved by it generally speaking i think joy is, is is a better emotion than relief for that kind of stuff yeah that is one thing i have heard honestly from players they run into the paywall and then not really sure that they feel it's worth their money to continue and also on that point there seems to be a lot of confusion and complication, I guess, on the way you buy stuff in Lotro with VIP quest packs, there's expansion packs, and even in the Lotro store, there's like expansion quests. And then there's also the bundle you mentioned, the expansion trope, which is nice, but maybe doesn't include some features the old expansions included originally. So are there any plans to maybe streamline and simplify that process for getting content overall along with that? Yeah, I think we'd like to. It's just going to be a question of, of what is the right approach for it. Um, some of the things that we're fighting, and I'm, I'm sure Cord has talked about this in the past, is just, you know, our website is, is pretty old. Uh, and, you know, some aspects of our store are pretty locked in, um, and they're not fully in our control. And we're working to modernize a lot of those things, but that unfortunately does take time. Um, but that, yeah, that is definitely something that we are talking about internally and hoping to improve. All right. Then I guess shifting from talking about the all this older stuff to actually talk about some more recent updates, we had update 30 released earlier this month, Blood of Azog, and with that there was the Azinobolzar zone and the Blood of Azog storyline with that, along with the new single boss raid, and it also had a lot of class balance changes. But yeah. with all that stuff, since there was a lot in that, is there any particular part of the update that you all felt was successful or maybe unsuccessful? Um, so I think it's it's still a little early for us to be definitive on this. I think the feeling internally is um, we, we were generally happy with a lot of the player feedback that we've been getting. Um, it was a little more muted than I think some folks expected. Um, I think that, you know, I've watched some streams, uh, including yours, and I think that generally uh, you and other folks have been enjoying the experience that you've been getting. Um, so I think that overall we're, we're reasonably satisfied with uh, the, the express player sentiment that we've seen. I think that one of the things and I, and this this is where my my ignorance is going to show up a little bit um we don't we haven't done a ton of these smaller updates in a while that uh are at max level without increasing the level cap right so so uh u30 blood of azog and azanul bazaar those are 130 level uh zones and quests and so um it's been interesting for us to see how that has affected things um i think that we're not entirely sure yet how it's going to shake out. Um, there's a lot of theories around, you know, why we're seeing some behavior that we're seeing. Um, so it, the, I guess the short answer is uh, reasonably happy, but but we're not like, uh, uh, I don't think anyone thinks this is like a home run, 
or anything like okay. that. There's definitely a lot of stuff that we've been we've been noticing and learning, and I th I think that will make uh, Gundabad better, and definitely stuff that I'm noting as we talk about doing future updates in this style, um, in the years to come. Okay, so it sounds like you might not have any specifics yet, but is there anything that you maybe have learned from that that you could apply to future updates? Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that you mentioned, class balance changes. Uh, we were worried how much we'd be able to pull off and how much it would affect things. Um, thus far, we've been pretty happy with the way that uh, the class balance changes have played out. Uh, landscape players have been, you know, fine and happy and haven't really seen any serious uh, repercussions, which is great. Um, and we've seen better balance across uh, high-level group content, um, including, you know, 3, 6, and 12 player stuff. Um, so that's been that's been great to see so it's it's uh it's given us a good understanding that like okay this is something that we can do in this fashion uh and as we're looking at gundabad we're definitely looking very closely at at where things stood out there um let me think on the flip side one of the things that i remember getting called out was we we tied some explorer deeds to rare mob spawns and that led to some consternation from folks that uh they basically had to felt like they had to camp out spawns uh, in order to complete these deeds. So that's one of the things we're, we're going, okay, maybe maybe that's not the right way to tie that content. We, you know, we, we do like having these these rare mobs, um, but we don't want players to feel like they're forced to com to find them and hunt them down to, to get the, some of these meta deeds done um, that they've always been getting done. So into thinking about different structures for stuff like that. Those are off the top of my head, sort of the, the things that come to mind. All right. And another new thing that recently came out were two new legendary servers, Treebeard and Shadowfax. And they also came with that landscape difficulty feature where you can change the difficulty. And could you maybe share a little bit about these servers and maybe some differences compared to the earlier servers of Anor and Ithil, based on maybe some things you learned from the launch of those? Uh, so, I mean, generally, this this launch went a lot more smoothly from what I've been told. Uh, I wasn't here for Anor and Ithil, but uh, from what folks have, have said to me, uh, this has gone a lot uh, a lot easier. Um, you know, we've had good player populations in both. Uh, the early returns seem to indicate that Treebeard's been a little bit more popular, um, but it's, uh, it's only day two, so uh, too early to say for sure. We'll see what the long-term shakes out. Um, the difficulty uh, quest stuff that we added has been pretty well received as well. Um, there are some things that we want to improve around the user experience for that. Uh, and Cord's talked about some of that stuff in the forums. Like uh, there's been uh, complaints about the blur effect around, uh, I think it's the Sauron debuff that, that pops up at, at Deadly. And the uh, the way that we structured the uh, the quest order, uh, where it wasn't necessarily clear what level of difficulty tied to uh, which quest, yeah, necessarily. Um, so that and a couple of other things that we've we've noticed and, and picked up on and we're planning to fix. Um, overall, it's been it's been pretty smooth. It's been it's been pretty exciting. You know, we got picked up by Gamespot. That was great to see. Uh, nice to get that stuff out to a wider audience. Um, the, the early indications that are that we saw players coming back to play this uh, and that's great you know we want to we want to encourage players to, to experience the kind of stuff that they they want to experience um, but yeah it's it's only day two we're still gonna see how that shakes out with you know u30 was almost a month ago and we're still trawling through the data so we definitely don't have anything yeah. definitive yet uh, at a high level that I can I can give you for uh, the new legendary servers uh, I think I think we can say confidently right now that uh, they are uh, successful so far, um, but we'll just have to see how, how successful they, they are. All right, I know. I can personally say I had a lot of fun on Treebeard last night, but one concern I have and have seen other players is the longevity of these servers, like if the player counts will start dropping in the future as more updates are released on them. Is that a concern for you all? Yeah, I mean, we definitely would prefer if players stuck around and played, right? Um, part of the reason that we, we shifted to the server structure where we had two servers, you know, one fast and one slow was to see, okay, you know, if we gave players more or less time as, as some folks were hoping for, um, how that how they would react to that. Um, and we're hopeful that that will lead to uh, improvement in terms of how long some of those player populations last. But, um, you know, it's certainly a concern. I don't think it's a super high concern for us right now. Um, 
we'll see how things things go. You know, I know I know that there's been some reports already of players uh, hitting cap on on Treebeard, but not yet on Shadowfax, which I thought was a little funny. Uh, that is odd. <laughs> I, I haven't personally looked into it. Uh, I, it's just something that I that, that crossed my uh, crossed my plate. Um, but that, I, I think that that's uh, an indication of, of some players are, are playing these things differently. And, you know, if, if the, the, there's plenty of stuff to do outside of cap, uh, there's plenty of stuff to do, including, you know, rolling alts and, and going through and experiencing the content in multiple different ways. Um, so for us, it's uh, it's a lot of wait and see. Um, but we, we definitely don't want... Uh, we don't want to see these these servers go away anytime soon, and we have no expectation that they will. All right. Um. So talking about upcoming content, looking forward, I guess two big things coming later this year to Lotro is the Brawler class and the Gundabad expansion. I already talked a little bit about Gundabad, but as far as the Brawler goes, is the plan, I guess, still to release that maybe as a pre-order reward for Gundabad to play it before the expansion? Yeah, th those are going to be tied together. Um, I don't know how much we've announced around that, so I don't want to get ahead of uh, whatever marketing stuff we've got going on. Um, but what I can say is that uh, they're both, uh, they, they should be releasing around the same time, um, and they're both going reasonably well right now for us. Um, I, uh, I have another Brawler playtest, I think, on Tuesday. Uh, and I actually got to see a lot of the, I should say a lot, like three of the new zones for, for Gundabad uh, earlier today. Uh, and that was really exciting, including a handful of instances, uh, mission instances, and uh, three in, and, and uh, six player instances, I think. Definitely three player instances. I don't remember if I saw a six player instance. Um, but that was really cool to see. Stuff's coming on really well. It looks really impressive. I think that's one of those things that's that sort of really blew me away when I got back into Lotro is uh, the game looks impressively good considering its age. Uh, it's it's very impressive to me that there's just a number of these little touches uh, and the quality of the art. Uh, and, and frankly, the, the world building has gotten a lot better. Um, playing through some of these older zones and then seeing what the new zones look like, it's like, wow, okay, this is, this is leaps and bounds past what uh, some of the open and stuff looked like. Uh, it turns out 14 years, long time. Yes. Yeah, Lotra has had a lot of content over the years, a lot of variety too. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, I can't give you uh, more clarity than that. But the the, the short version is, uh, from where I'm sitting, everything is is going roughly the way that we expect it to go, um, which is a uh, which is a pleasant surprise always. Yeah, from the player perspective, I think that definitely sounds like a good thing. As yeah, well. yeah. I, I think that players will be pretty excited and happy. There's some, there's some really cool stuff that we're doing that I don't believe we've ever done uh, in Lotro before for for both of the for both the Brawler and for for Gundabad. Uh, okay. And so uh, we're pretty excited about it internally, and we hope that once players have the opportunity to see and experience it, that you'll feel the same way. Okay, I did have a couple more questions on the Brawler. If you are able to answer it, and at a point where you even know for these but first i'm curious what roles the brawler will have like tank dps or something else um yeah. uh so this is uh this is based on my recollection i believe uh that the brawler will have a tank role and a dps role um i don't i i think there may have been uh sort of a support role but i i frankly could be misremembering um but i'm reasonably confident on tank and dps Okay, and then another thing I was curious on with the Baroning, they have their own race, so their own starter area. Will the Brawler be like all the other classes in their starter areas based on the race, or will they actually have their own? So they'll be like uh, like the Warden and the Runekeeper, okay. uh, other classes that we've introduced like that. So yeah, they'll they'll they won't they won't be their own race. Um, they will definitely you you will definitely be able to play as them with different races. Um, I believe we're still locking down which ones we feel are the most lore appropriate. Um, but I anticipate that by the time that we're previewing the Brawler, uh, that should be known. Or, or we should be able to answer that question okay. uh, soon after. And speaking of previewing the Brawler, when do you think we might see it in beta for us to test? Beta is tricky. Um, I think the goal is to get it to Palantir uh, later this month. Um, 
beta i'm honestly not sure about what the plan is i don't want to i don't want to make the call for my for my team i think that you know uh august is probably a, a reasonable estimate um but what i can do is uh i can check with them and, and make sure that i'm not putting you in a bad spot by saying that that's right. my recollection but i don't have my notes in front of me so i apologize all right that is fine um and going back to gundabad I guess you talked a little bit about some exciting things, but are there any particular features that you could maybe share about that yet at this point? Yeah, I don't think that there's anything I can say. I think that um, going to, I mean, missions are, are coming back. Okay. If anyone had any questions about that, I, I, I've sort of spilled the beans on that one already. Um, we There's another system that we, we used um, in a previous expansion that we're actually bringing back and we're spending a lot of time updating. Um, we've talked a lot about our LI revamp as well. Um, that's something that uh, we're hoping will actually be ready with, with everything as well. And, and thus far, it looks like it will be. Um, we've actually started previewing some of the changes in Palantir on the forums. We haven't gotten to the part where we're showing that stuff in game. It's not quite ready for that. Um, but uh, it's it's gotten we've gotten some initial feedback from players on Palantir uh, around our, our LI changes. Uh, it's mostly been aligned with what we expected. Um, I don't think there's any, been anything hugely surprising from what I've seen at least. Uh, and so we're just continuing to iterate on that one. I'm trying to remember if there's any other features off the top of my head. Um, no, I think those are the big ones. Um, I think for the most part, this is going to look like a pretty. Uh, familiar expansion we feel like with the li revamp the brawler that those are two pretty big changes that's going to affect a lot of players in a lot of different ways um so we thought that bringing one back more so, sorry that bringing back one more system uh would be enough and that that doing too much beyond that might lead to more player confusion than we would actually benefit from all right and on the li revamp is there any details you can share on how it might look different from the current li system we have um, I've talked about some of this before, but like we're really trying to avoid creating the grinding situations that we've had thus far with the current allies. Um, so we're taking we're taking a very holistic view of the allies and going. Uh, so I think one of the things that I can I can say here is um, the new allies are essentially a replacement of the current ally system. Um, it's not gonna it's not gonna be like a switch we flip and you know when we release this that your current weapons are, are or your other uh, legendary items are no longer uh, useful um, but we will be phasing them out and that's intentional because we want to make sure uh, that some of the problems that those uh, items are causing don't persist as we introduce the new system um, and the new system is intended to be a lot easier for players to catch up on so for example you know if you uh, play the game and then you miss, you know, an expansion or a couple updates. Um, that when you come back, you don't have to go through all of those same processes that those players went through in order to catch up and get it back up to cap. The process is going to be a lot smoother. It's going to be a lot simpler. Um, it's going to be a lot more, frankly, playing the game and less about grinding to get, you know, to a place where you can comfortably, you know, start doing three player stuff maybe start getting into lower tier six players content but definitely be able to do end game uh, and level without feeling like you're stuck and you're having a bad experience i'm sure for players at high level rating that they're they're going to really want to max min max and that's where more of the grind is going to be seen um but that's something we're comfortable with because those players are super engaged and, and they, they if they really want to min max we're going to give them the opportunity but we're not going to make it easy on them uh, but for players that are a bit more casual which is you know frankly a lot of our players are are still leveling um we want to make sure that that experience isn't detrimental for them and that they're not getting stuck in places where they feel like you know i can't i can't compete anymore with these mobs because i didn't invest the time to run a bunch of instances you know two level caps ago all right that sounds actually all exciting to me and like that type of grind you mentioned to min max after you get to end game that's the type of grind i personally like so yeah that's something i would probably look forward to that's something that I'm in, that I enjoy as well. Um, I think that that's that's a really f the game, but I totally we totally recognize that that's not everyone's cup of tea, and we don't want to force players to grind just to be able to keep up with their leveling. Um, we want them to feel like they can pr play the game at their speed, without feeling like 
they're having a terrible experience because of this item that we gave them. Uh, you know, it's just not it's just not pleasant or enjoyable for those players, um, and we totally get that. So that's that's one of the big things that we're working on. There's a bunch of other pieces that I'm uh, being very vague about. There's actually a whole new system that we're tying into this uh, that I'm really personally excited about because I think it really opens the door for a lot of really cool stuff in the future. Um, and I think that players, once they see it, will also feel really good about it. Um, based on the early Palantir feedback, everyone's been very positive about that aspect so far. Yeah, that sounds good. But one thing I'm curious if you can share this detail, will it maybe be just one legendary item that you advance compared to having all these third ages, second ages, first ages as you level up and the such? So we will be simplifying that a lot. Um, I believe that the, the first, second, third age distinction is going away. Um, at least in the current iteration that we're, we're talking about right now. Um, some classes will have multiples, and, and technically speaking, we're not going to force you to only have one LI or the, as many as your class would normally equip. Um, but uh, the plan is to make sure that you can, by just playing the game normally, just by leveling normally, that you'll be able to get your, your first LI pretty much done reasonably um maybe two depending on if your class uses multiple like that uh but for if you're if you're trying to have multiple so that you can you know as a, again as a raider so that you can swap between different boss fights um or you know swap depending on you want to be able to run your raid at with multiple uh multiple roles you know between boss fights for example again um that's going to be a lot trickier for you you're going to have to spend a lot more time investing that we're not going to lock you out of it but we're not again we're not going to make your life easy if that's excuse me if that's something that you really want to do um but that's uh but again like for most players that won't be a huge consideration from from our perspective all right so it sounds like that feature could be ready with gundabad and one thing on Gundabad that I was curious, is there something you might have learned from Minas Morgul and the War of Three Peaks that you might do differently with Gundabad? That's a good question. I unfortunately don't think I'm the best person to answer it just because I wasn't here for, for Minas Morgul or War of Three Peaks, so I haven't uh, I haven't been able to, to sort of internalize those lessons or, or connect those lessons as easily. I am sure that there uh, are things that have shifted. I think with missions probably would be a, a thing that I've heard about that, you know, we did missions before Three Peaks and, and we're shifting the way that we're thinking about them uh, with, uh, with Gundabad. I don't think it's like a huge philosophical shift, but it is, you know, learning from what we did previously, you know, and, and you saw some of that, I think, with Blood of Azog. Um, and we will be learning from, from what we, we did here as well. Okay, so as far as the expansion goes, is there maybe a time in the future where you think we might see more information on this? Yeah, I think that um, we're going to start moving that stuff over to Palantir probably in the next month or so. Hello. Um, <laughs> he's He gets very I, lonely sometimes. I have to ask, what is his name? His name is Link. He is named after uh, the titular hero of Legend of Zelda uh, because we are giant nerds in this household, as you can tell from my background. Um, what was I saying? Sorry, I, I, I apologize. I totally lost my train of thought. I get distracted very easily, too. But uh, it was about when we might see more information on good and bad. Yes, thank you. I think that... Um, you know, similar to Brawler, I would say that sometime in August. I definitely do not expect early August that you'll see a lot of stuff, but but definitely I think sometime in August is probably more reasonable. Um, Cord, you might actually be able to answer that one <laughs> at some point. Um, yeah, I, I, I uh, that's that's the date I'll, I'll give you right now. We'll, right. we'll hopefully we'll be able to do it a little bit sooner, but August is when I'm, I think is reasonably comfortable. Well, I am looking forward to that. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're excited to see August, players. Reaction. August sounds fine, as far as I know, too. Yeah, I don't think I've got anything more specific than that. Good. I'm glad I didn't step in at this time. All right. So jumping ahead past Gundabad and looking ahead into the future, it seems like there are a lot of possibilities for Lotro and like 2022 and beyond. And as far as I know, nothing has actually been shared about any possible hints of where you all might be going. So, do you have anything you can share on that? No, unfortunately, I uh, I can't I can't give you any hints. Um, what I can say is that um, 
one of the things that I uh, worked with folks on when I when I got here is, uh, you know, Lotro's been around for for almost fifteen years now. And our anniversary is coming up this coming April, um, and we wanted to be around for another fifteen years. So we started thinking about uh, more long term. What are some of the stories that we want to tell? Um, what are the stories that we've hinted at that we haven't necessarily resolved? Um, and uh, you know, I asked folks to to send me some pitches of of the the kinds of things that they want to to see and and uh, have players experience in, in Lotro, and um, they gave me more than sixteen years worth of new content. <laughs> wow! Um, and that was from from not even that much time. So so there's plenty of awesome stories that we think we can tell, uh, and we did pick out you know internally which pitch we thought was the strongest and we we started on that um it is very very early you know no real work has been done on it and our focus has been pretty much entirely on going to bed um but we wanted to sort of start percolating on interior uh, inside the studio uh some of the ideas that we wanted to think about for for the coming years and uh you know it's another one of those places where uh you know as someone who's fairly casual lord of the rings fan uh I got excited by it, so I'm really excited to see uh, what we do with it internally, and then excited to see what players feel about it. Um, I think that we'll probably talk about it, you know, maybe in the producer's letter uh, that for, that's that we'll probably do uh, for next year. Um, but you know, our focus right now is very much on making sure that Gundabad is the best expansion that we can put out. All right, so. One thing with the Midsummer Festival going on, and you might not be able to share, I guess, any specifics on this, but Volume 5 was The Great Wedding was last year, and it says that I think it will be continued in a future update. So Mm -hmm. do you think it actually will be continued? I did check with the team on this because um, I wasn't entirely sure the answer to this question uh, when you you first threw it at me. Um, the, The... the way that we see it internally uh, is that the Black Book of Mordor sort of is it, it wrapped up, but what we uh, have been doing with the Legacy of Durin for the past few years is sort of a continuation of that. Um, so it does chronologically happen after uh, the Black Book of Mordor ends. So Midsummer is sort of uh, a stitch in time where it, it doesn't fit quite neatly into where it's placed in that order. Uh, it's actually I believe happening during the legacy of Durin. Um, and, but yes, there, there, there is, uh, there are plans to continue that story. Um, we will be, we will be, we will be telling stories after Midsummer. Um, I don't think that, uh, anything in the immediate future will connect to it, but, uh, next year I think is more likely. All right. And then another type of content, I guess with update 29, we had Wildwood, which was below the level cap. I think that was the first time since like four Kel and Evendom were added to the game. So are there any plans to maybe do zones like that in the future as well? Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we really liked how Wildwood did. Uh, players loved it. Um, we saw really good results from that. We loved working on it internally. Uh, that came out just before I started, so it was one of the first things that I started hearing about when I when I got here. Um, we definitely want to do more stuff. Um, I don't know how frequent that's going to be. Uh, my hope is to do... There's definitely some great places in the world and some great stories that we think we can we can tell w- in that same style. Um, the, the frequency and, and duration of that is going to be a bit tricky, but uh, I think that... Uh, next year is another good opportunity for us to do something like that. Uh, I don't think it'll be quite the same as Wildwood, but sort of in the same spirit. All right. And thinking outside of content in the future, are there any maybe features or system changes, class changes, revamps, or anything like that that you all have plans for for 2022? Nothing concrete. Um, Some of the things we've talked about are... uh, really taking a closer look at the trait lines, taking a closer look at crafting, taking a closer look at kinships. Um, I think those are probably the three biggest candidates that I remember from the top of my head. Um, I don't think it'll we'll get to all three next year. Um, my hope is that we'll be able to get to two. Uh, I don't think that they have to necessarily be tied to an expansion uh, in the way that we sort of tied LI, the LI revamp to an expansion in terms of the timing. 
Um, not that you will need the expansion to, to get the LI revamp. Um, so it's going to depend on sort of, we'll see how how we sort of come out of Gundabad. I'm start I'm starting to think about post Gundabad more than the team is, um, and starting to think about you know planning ahead and, and thinking about how that will play out. Um, but I'm at the point right now where I have a decent idea of the kinds of things that we think we would want to talk about, and I need to start asking the team serious questions around. Okay, what's what are the feasibility of these things? Um, because I I know that something is going to be bigger than I understand it. Uh, but I don't want to pull them away from that stuff right now as they're making great progress on Gundabad. So um, in the next couple months, probably I will uh, discreetly grab them periodically to sort of have those conversations, um, but uh, won't know for sure which ones it's going to be. Uh, I think that's something else we'll, we'll be able to announce early next year, maybe late this year. Okay, so talking about the future, though, one thing you may be familiar with is the Inet Global 7 acquiring Daybreak Games and their investor presentation. They had a note on Ultra Upgrade planned for 2022, and in that it said visual and technical upgrades for Lotro and for PC and next-gen consoles next year, 2022. So yeah. do you have any information on that? So uh, we are still planning to do additional technical and visual upgrades. Um, we are still defining the scope of some of those. Some of that's just going to depend on uh, once we start really digging into it, how, how big those those projects become. Um, from our perspective, we see the, the first of those in 2022 as the sort of the start of that process, not the end of that process. It's not like we're going to be rolling out, you know, a whole mess of visual and technical improvements in 2022, and then we'll wash our hands and walk away. Um, we think that that is going to be a steady drumbeat of stuff. Um, as for consoles, unfortunately, that's not something I can really talk about at this time. Um, you know, obviously, we we understand what our parent company has announced, but we can't sort of uh, can't jump the gun past that, unfortunately. All right. Yeah, I know that has been a pretty hot topic in the normally, I guess, Lotro community, but the MMO community and people calling it like a big graphics overhaul. Is that something we could expect, like a huge change in graphics and the such? That's a I don't know that I have a good answer to that question right now, unfortunately. Um, part of that is it's going to be in the eye of the beholder. I don't think that. I don't think that you're gonna, you know, log into Lotro one day and suddenly it's gonna look like a, a game that's releasing on a next-gen console in 2022. Uh, let me put it that way. I think you'll you'll still be able to to identify it as Lotro. Um, that said, um, we're hopeful that you'll see improvement beyond what we've been doing recently. All right, and on the note with graphics, one kind of related concern is with optimization of the game and just performance in general. Uh, would maybe multi-threading or something like that be a possibility in the future? So this is this is where I can say yes, it is a possibility. Multi-threading is unfortunately not a simple thing. Um, not because uh, so if you are making a modern game on a modern game engine, it is not that complicated to do because frankly, a lot of engines handle that for you. Unfortunately, Lotro's engine is much older than most modern game engines uh, and has not been updated as consistently as those engines. Um, so it is not as simple of a uh, thing to do as we would like it to be, frankly. Um, I think that you know we've been able to get away with the fact that CPUs are really, really damn powerful these days. Uh, and so we, we haven't necessarily needed to break open that seal and really figure out how to make that happen. But it is something that is on our list of things that we think would be really valuable for us to do. Um, and you know, depending on other, other improvements and how those things go, it's something that we potentially could get to sooner rather than later. But it's still, it's, it's still a big, gnarly problem, unfortunately. All right, so that is the last question I had concerning future content. So we have covered now the recent content and, well, the future content. So the, I guess, last few moments of this interview, I did want to cover some viewer questions. While I did sprinkle some in already, there are a lot of kind of random ones on different specific topics in the game. Sure, grab bag, let's do it. Um, so 
Let's see, it looks like the first one I have here is on levels and stats. In particular, it sounded like a lot of people would be interested in a level squish. Have you all considered this or have any even plans for doing something like this? So I don't think it, as of this time there's any plan to do a level squish. It's something that we have talked about a little bit internally in conversations that I've been a part of. I am very confident that it's a conversation that has happened several times before I got here, uh, just because uh, a lot of other games have done this. You know, Notably, WoW has done this, I think, like three or four times at this point. Um, I, I don't know specifically uh, all the reasons why we've avoided doing it in the past. Um, speaking as someone who's enjoying the game as a player, I totally understand that it can feel a little bit Im intimidating to, to sort of see a really big number like 130. Um, but uh, there's an aspect of it that I, I feel really really fits with the world. Um, it, it sort of gives you your own uh, large, long, and fascinating journey to go on. Um, and I feel like that really does capture the spirit of uh, of the Lord of the Rings. Um, on the stat squish side, um, it's sort of a similar conversation there. Um, I think that uh, we're having conversations internally around you know the number of stats we have and their relative values you know primary secondary tertiary stats um i think that there's an opportunity for us in the future to, to really spend more time thinking about how those are used um especially some of the tertiary stats can be a little bit obtuse um and, and you know there's there's various issues with them and and and, and all sorts of ways that that uh, players have cataloged uh, and that we're aware of, um, but it is—it's a pretty holistic thing for us to to do, and it does require a good bit of engineering to figure out how we make that happen. Um, so we don't have any specific plans at this time, but it is definitely a conversation we're continuing to have internally. Okay, and then one thing I am wondering from the, I guess, developer or producer in your case viewpoint, how do you decide when it might be necessary? to actually do a level or stat squish? That's a great question. Um, I th so part of it is understanding uh, what is the value that that brings, right? What is that value that it brings to the player to, to suddenly have a smaller level cap, to have uh, smaller stat numbers, to have a smaller morale pool, um, a smaller power pool? Uh, and then comparing that against what is the work required to make that happen and uh you know what is this something that we need to do you know periodically like wow it's done periodically or is it something that we feel like we can get away with for you know indefinitely almost i, I think indefinitely probably ne doesn't necessarily ever happen just considering the life cycle of these 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 games um but that's generally the the understanding is like what is the value relative to the cost um if the value is higher than the cost, then generally speaking, that's something that we want to do. You know, if the value is a lot higher than the cost, then uh, we generally will prioritize it higher than other things. But if the value is is more aligned with the cost, then it's it's not necessarily as easy to do. The other thing to be mindful of as well is, you know, who does what kind of uh, specialties or talents does it require, and do we have those in house? Um, you know, for example, if uh, it requires some sort of engineering that none of our engineers are uh, comfortable with or have necessarily done, then we're going to be a bit more careful about going down that road than if it's something that we already know that we can do. Um, just because when you're experimenting with something that you have never necessarily done, even if other folks have sort of solved that problem, uh, there tend to be a lot more pitfalls than you're going to necessarily know ahead of time. And so that means that the cost that you're, you're evaluating is almost always going to be smaller than the actual cost. Um, so that's sort of the way that I, I approach thinking about that. And, and frankly, most other things, it comes down to, you know, what is the value that we're bringing to players versus what is the cost of doing that work? All right, to shift topics quite a bit, uh, the next big, I guess, popularity and comments was on game systems. And we already covered the legendary item system, but one thing I have been a big fan of with Virtue XP is y'all have added over time more and more ways to get Virtue XP, such as missions recently. Are there any plans to continue adding more ways to get Virtue XP, for example? 
Uh, none, none that I'm aware of at this point. Um, the the Li revamp, there might be some additional things that we do there, um, but I don't think that there's anything widespread that I'm aware of. All right, and the next system, I guess. This one, I have to be honest, is probably my least favorite part of the game progression-wise is the clash trait points. And mm. I am curious if you all have ever had any thoughts or plans on maybe changing the way you get those? Yeah, there have been some conversations around that. Um, I think it's uh, it's one of those things where your decisions were made at the time that made a lot of sense, but as the game has continued and we look back on those decisions, we go, okay, is this necessarily the best way of doing it? Um, so it's something that we're aware of and we're thinking about, uh, but it is not as simple of a change as it may appear um there's a there's a lot of legacy stuff to go through to make sure that whatever change we make makes sense and uh it doesn't cause more problems than it's all than it's attempting to solve i should say uh, but yeah it, it's definitely something we're thinking about all right and once again to change things up there are a few comments on the servers and one thing of particular interest was EU servers, and if there are any plans to actually have servers located in the EU. We'd like to have uh, servers located in the EU. Um, something, you know, now that we are owned by a, a company in Scandinavia, they have some familiarity with that concept. Um, and it's not uh, it's not off the table by any stretch, uh, but it is an ongoing conversation. Um, setting up servers like that is unfortunately more complicated than just uh renting some space in a data center uh there's a lot of uh there's a lot of networking work and uh obviously server work that needs to happen for that not to mention the business implications so um it is unfortunately slower moving than we necessarily would like but it is something that we're discussing okay and speaking of server work with the closed servers do you all have any estimate on when players might be able to transfer from the closed worlds to ones that are live now? So that has been making progress. Um, we would fixed some bugs around that recently that were preventing us. Um, I think folks can now see that you can technically, you can technically see that you're, you can attempt to transfer characters to Palantir and, Bomb and, uh, and Bombadil, I think. Maybe it's Bold Roar. I don't remember specifically between those two. Um, that's because we're testing it, basically, and we're continuing to test it. Um, as we have been testing it, we have we have found new issues, uh, and so it's sort of unclear to us where the end of that process is going to be. Um, my hope it's soon, but frankly, that's just a guess at this point. All right, and one more question I do have on servers: Has there been any thoughts on maybe like another server merge, or perhaps even closing down a world with low population? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, no one's brought it up to me yet. Uh, I think that we're generally happy with our server populations thus far. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think that there's been. If there's any conversation, I'm certainly unaware of it. All right, and then yeah, it's time to switch topics again. I guess as we have just a few more minutes left, but uh, one thing that has changed over time a lot in Lotro is the instance panel and maybe group finder type system. Have you all had any plans on adding like a traditional dungeon finder type system to the game again? I certainly would like to. Um, that's right now a lower priority for me, just based on the, some of the other thing, topics that are brought up are, are sort of bigger things. Um, I think that there's some opportunities for those kinds of systems. Uh, they frankly make pugs dramatically easier and they get a lot more players into content that they might otherwise not see, um, which we both we think are, are both pretty great results uh, overall, but they're not as simple as just flipping a switch. Um, there's additional UI work to do, and there's additional design work to do to make sure that stuff happens. Um, I don't have a, a sense of where that might go on the schedule at this point, but it is definitely something that I personally think is, is a big value add to the game. Uh, it's just not as big a value add right now as some of the other bigger topics that I'm, I'm focusing on. All right, and actually the last question I really have is on the maps and the newer style versus the old parchment style uh, maps. And it sure. seems like there are people who like the old one, people who like the new one. 
So are there maybe any thoughts you have on that or potentially having an option to go between parchment style and the new style? So I, I, I actually, shortly after I started, I, I ran into this conversation on the forums and I reached out to the team. And so I don't remember specifically the explanation that they gave me, but there was there were technical considerations with uh, giving players that option. Um, and it's, a, it's not a question of can it be done, it's a question again of sort of what is the value of giving players that option versus uh, the other work that, that those people could be working on. Um, and we, the determination was made, and it makes sense, and I'm, I'm, I totally understand it, that that work is not as valuable right now as some other stuff. Um, we don't uh, update old maps too often. We sort of only do it when it when it makes sense because we're making other changes to those areas, uh, generally speaking. So uh, I think that that's something that we might consider in the future. Um, but unfortunately, it's one of those things that requires a decent amount of engineering work, and that that continues to be the place where we are most strapped. Um, you know, we have new folks, but they're still getting up to speed, and they're focusing on some of those bigger things like the LI changes, um, and those, frankly, are just more valuable to more players than for folks who uh, want to have the toggle and be able to see some of those old maps again. All right, since that is the last question I have, I guess we do have a couple more minutes. If you have any other thoughts or comments you just want to make. Uh, well, thank you, first of all, for, for giving me this opportunity. I appreciate you reaching out and, uh, and getting this done. It was, it's been really great to speak with you about this. And I hope that uh, for players who have the opportunity to check this out, that this helps answer some of the questions that they have. Um, you know, I think that uh, one of the things that we're really passionate about at the studio is Lord of the Rings Online, frankly. Um, basically, everybody at the studio uh, plays this game. And even people who don't, who aren't on the Lord of the Rings team are playing this game. Uh, we, we, we have people at Daybreak and we have people at EG7 who play this game. And that's really not as common as you might think uh, at some studios. Um, you know, there's there's always a, there's always a, a population at studios that play their own game, but it is not necessarily as big a group as I see here. Um, we really care about this. You know, we're here working on this game and not something uh, more traditionally big or exciting, because we we really do believe in it. And you know, we're really happy at what you folks are uh, are giving back to us most of the time. And uh, just you know, thank you for for caring about this product that we are spending so much of our lives on. All right. Yeah, so that sounds good with us. I do want to thank you for being here and taking your time to answer all these questions. All right, everyone, that is all I have for the interview. As I mentioned before, this was my first time ever giving an interview to anybody. I think it's kind of crazy that I'm even in a position that this was a possibility, but as I said at the end of this, I do want to express my thanks to Brennania and everybody at the Lotro team. The community manager, Cordovan, was there as well, didn't really talk much, but do want to thank everybody that was involved and all the viewers that helped make this possible. Everybody that's like not only submitted questions and the such, which I definitely appreciate that, but even the people that just watch my content and have helped make this a possibility. And one note I do have on the interview is I actually thought it went really well. We found out some interesting things and I tried to find some, ask some, say, more open ended questions to just find more out about the perspective Standing Stone Games has on Lotro, and there were some really interesting things that were there. So I hope you all enjoyed it and learned a lot of useful stuff about Lotro, the new producer Renania, of course, and the going ons at Standing Stone Games with Lotro. And with that, if you all do have any feedback on this, do please let me know. And if you enjoy this type of content and perhaps would want to see more in the future, please do comment that below. And one of the things you can really do to help is maybe share this interview with somebody that might be interested. And again, I do want to reiterate that I hope you all enjoyed this and learned something useful. And if you did, please consider liking and subscribing for more or becoming a channel member to support the content. And thanks for watching, everyone.